Good morning. morning. Please join me in the call to worship as it is printed in the bulletin. Lord, teach us to pray so that we might awaken to the wonder of your presence, so we might feel gratitude for your gift of life today, so we might discover your kingdom as revealed in our sisters and brothers, so we might find safety beneath the shelter of your wings. So we might declare your glory as we gather together. Lord, teach us to pray. Join me in prayer. O God, source of all beauty and goodness, your grace comes fresh every morning. In each new day you give us light. We praise you for your never-failing love that satisfies our needs and shows us the way to follow. We rejoice in your constant care for your faithful, in your love for all people, offering your salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. If we say that we have no sin, we are deceiving ourselves, as God's word says, and the truth is not in us. So often we do deceive ourselves and think of ourselves as as righteous, but then we look at our lives, our thoughts, our words, and our deeds, and we compare them to the graciousness and the goodness and the justice of God. We see how much we have fallen short. But the word also says that if we confess our sins, God is faithful and will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. So together, let us pray. You are only as far away 
as the sound of our whispers will travel, Lord. Yet we so often struggle to speak with you intimately. Forgive us when we are shallow, seeking a quick blessing or a fast favor from you without being willing to invest fully in a trusting, committed relationship with you. Forgive us when we are one-sided, asking always for mercy and compassion, but not returning the same. Forgive us when we approach you, begging for guidance and direction, but then neglect to follow your instructions. Forgive us when we cry out with our pressing questions, but then stop listening for your answers. May we have another chance to appreciate the fullness of your love. May we try once again to shed our self-interest and find joy in serving your interests. Hear our purposeful prayers. Amen. We continue in our personal and silent prayers of confession. Of Holy Scripture. As far as the East is from the West, so far has our God removed our transgressions from us. Friends, believe the good news of the Gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are. may be seated. Good morning again, and welcome to worship at Cherry Hill Presbyterian Church. Whether you're with us here in person today or with us virtually, we're happy to be worshiping with you. If you're worshiping in the sanctuary, please let us know of your presence by signing the friendship books. These are the red-covered books located on both ends of the pew. Following worship, all are invited to continue to our time of fellowship at coffee hour in Memorial Parlor. We welcome to our pulpit this morning the Reverend Mary Ann Grano. Reverend Grano wears many hats, mother, wife, pastor, and lawyer. In addition to all of that, she serves as the stated clerk of the Presbytery of Detroit. You can read more about her in today's bulletin. Mary Ann, our thanks for being with us today and leading us in worship. Mark is on vacation until Wednesday, September 7th. However, he will be here next Sunday, September 4th, which will be our monthly celebration of communion. We also welcome back to Cherry Hill this morning, Tridib Chakraborty at the piano. Tridib has been here several times over the past three years, and we're always very grateful that he takes the time to share his musical gifts with us. Our fall schedule begins two weeks from today on September 11th with our Rally Day homecoming celebration. The day begins with worship at 1015, which will be followed by a brief dedication ceremony of the Peace Pole and Lending Library. These are gifts to Cherry Hill from Littlefield Presbyterian Church, and they are located just outside of the Weir Foyer entrance. Following the dedication, all are invited to join us for our rally in the alley. 
This year's rally will feature hot dogs, chips, dessert, and lots of good fellowship. To help our Church Growth and Fellowship Committee in their planning, there's a sign-up sheet on the table in Weir Foyer for those who plan to attend. Please read all of the announcements in today's bulletin for more information on what's coming up this fall. And if you did not receive the September issue of The Messenger by email or in the snail mail, please pick up a copy today after worship or download a copy from our website. It's full of lots of information about classes, concerts, and other exciting news in our congregation. Once again, welcome to worship.
Our gospel lesson today is from the Gospel of Luke. I saw that your pastor was leading you in a sermon series through the Lord's Prayer, and I thought we could wrap that up with the Luke version of the Lord's Prayer and consider one more time Christ's instruction as to how we are to draw near to God in this wonderful gift of prayer. And so Luke, the 11th chapter and beginning at the first verse, let us listen now for God's word to us. He was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. And he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend, and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread, for a friend of mine has arrived, and I have nothing to set before him. And he answers from within, do not bother me. The door has already been locked, and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, Even though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, at least because of his persistence, he will give up and give him whatever he needs. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Search, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened for you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds, and for everyone who knocks, the door will be opened. Is there anyone among you who, if your child asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if the child asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of every heart be acceptable in your sight. For you, O God, are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Although scripture doesn't just ask us, but commands us to pray, without ceasing, in fact, sometimes Christians find it hard to pray. Indeed, there are some among us who do not pray every day, besides perhaps a quick blessing before a meal or bedtime prayer. Speaking to God, really speaking to God, and with God can be intimidating, and and sometimes we hesitate to do it. Many folks in church are also very reluctant to pray out loud. I've met elders in Presbyterian churches who don't want to pray out loud because they're afraid, I think, of making a mistake. How can we possibly speak to Almighty God, to the creator of the universe? So this is the the question that the disciples ask. And Bible scholars know that this is the only time in all of the Gospels that the disciples actually ask to be taught anything. Luke 11, verse 1, teach us to pray. And Christ's answer is to give a simple prayer that we pray every week in church. Now, there is no wrong way to pray, friends. Max Lucado puts it this way. Is there a wrong way for a child to hug their parent? 
In the same way, there is no wrong way to pray before God. So none of us should be hesitant at all to pray out loud. God promises us that any prayer, any prayer that is sincerely offered will gain an audience in heaven. 1 John 5, 14 to 15 promises us this is the boldness we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have obtained the requests made of this. This is a great power that God has given to us freely by his grace to be able to make any request and he will hear it and if it is within his will, grant it for us. So we can speak to the almighty God with the ease with which we would speak to a friend or member of our own family. Just as you might send your friend a quick text just to say hi or call your spouse to say, I'm on my way home. It is all right to pray a short prayer to God, just to thank him for your food or just to ask him for help in a difficult situation. Yet just as a true friendship must be built on a deeper sharing than that, Times of deep and prolonged communion with God are essential to having a relationship with him. Jesus criticizes, though, long, wordy, flowery prayers meant more to glorify the prayer than to actually talk to God. And this is good news to me. I've heard some prayers in my life. God, forgive me. I've been kind of judgmental because they're so long and beautiful, but... I don't get the sense that the person is so much drawing uh, in, into God is maybe preaching through prayer. But notice that Jesus' sample prayer is a brief address. It's even shorter in the Lucan version, isn't it, than in the Matthew text. It's two and a half more verses. Two and a half verses. But we pray this prayer, Jesus' prayer, so many times, almost like it has a magic power. But Jesus really taught it not, I think, just so that we would repeat it over and over without thinking about it, so much as to give us a guideline or a rubric for our own sincere prayers to God. I had a gift with the Lord's Prayer recently. I went on the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, which is an ancient pilgrimage route that Christians have walked for over a thousand years to get to uh, the body of St. James. And my mother and I walked over a hundred miles um, to get there. And we often had opportunities to pray and and be part of Mass. And so I prayed the Lord's Prayer is the Padre Nuestro many, many times. And praying it in a different language actually prepared me for this sermon because it taught me to really think about the words that I had said so many times just by rote. And Jesus' rubric for prayer is really that, that rubric that we learn, many of us, in Sunday school as children. Acts, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication. It's really just that simple, this easy-to-remember mnemonic. And today, I would ask us to ponder what Jesus' prayer says and what it teaches us about how we should pray and why. So adoration, the prayer begins with adoration. Father, hallowed be your name. Now, why would we ever be called to adore and praise God? Doesn't God already know God is great? I mean, does God have a self-esteem issue? Of course not. But what tends to come out of your mouth and mine more? Joy or complaint? Do we use our mouths more to praise God or to whine about our situation? For example, how much do you and I complain about traffic, or bodily discomfort, or politicians, or annoying people? Maybe even sometimes to complain about our own church. How many 
times a day do you say something negative about the world? And how many times a day do you say something positive about God? And now here's an easy question. Which is more likely to improve your mood? Praise or complaint? Which is more likely to bring joy to those around you? Praise or complaint? Which is more likely to improve your relationship with God? Praise or complaint? And which do you think God wants to hear more? Praise or complaint? Praising God, friends, is not really for God. Praising God is really for us. Philippians 4, 8 admonishes, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep your eyes on the prize. Fix your mind on Christ. Sing his praises. Tell of his glory when you speak. Cry out, for thine and thine alone is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. But when our minds are fixed on adoring God, we immediately realize just how far we are from God. Most of our lives are self-centered, but when we praise God, we become God-centered. And this reorientation naturally humbles us and moves us to confess our sin. So confession is the second element of prayer, the C of Acts. Jesus' confession is short and simple. Forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. A moment now for debts and debtors. I've been asked many times, why do we use debts and debtors and Roman Catholics and other Christians say trespasses? Simple answer. Presbyterians use the King James. Episcopalians use the wording from the 1549 Book of Common Prayer. And the Roman Catholics use the wording from the Dewey Reims English translation of the Bible, which was based on the Vulgate and used trespasses. So it's not really a theological issue. It's just a translation issue. The best translation of the Bible, however, I must say, as a cradle Presbyterian, is probably debts, since the meaning of the Greek of the male of, of Thelima is literally debt. The meaning is that, that we owe a debt to God to the weight of our sins. Going further in the Greek, the NRSV translation is different from the King James because the NRSV says, forgive us for we forgive our debtors, but the King James is as we forgive our debtors. And I think that although it's only a slight difference, actually the Lord's Prayer correctly translated for we forgive our debtors is even more emphatic. It's not some kind of vague, as we forgive, like maybe someday when, when we get around to it, forgiving others would be a good idea. In fact, it's in the present perfect tense in, in Matthew. It says, we have forgiven our debtors already. Or we better have if we want God to forgive us. Unfortunately, it's pretty clear. Grace requires us to forgive, Luke says, everyone we're holding a grudge against. The purpose of the passing of the peace is not a meet and greet, and I see we don't have a pass, passing of the peace in this congregation today, but uh, the traditional passing of the peace is the moment when we celebrate the peace we have with one another. So if anyone in the church has annoyed you or disgruntled you, guess what, friends? You better go pass on that peace. And, you know, when I, when I say this, I usually say, now don't look too closely at who I'm passing the peace to today. Just kidding. But confession is that moment to ask God to help us amend our thoughts, words, and deeds so that we will live better and holier lives. Do not bring us to the time of trial, Jesus says. Oh my, Jesus is describing life as a trial being on trial, and that the evil one is going to test us and torment us. 
It's clear that Jesus took evil very seriously and meant us to recognize that each of us struggles with sin, and that struggle is so important. He also wanted us to recognize, though, that we're not alone in that struggle. But if we pray, God will save us from that time of trial, will give us guidance and direction to live our lives holier and holier. Recognizing God's gracious presence in our lives then moves us to thanks. And in Jesus' simple prayer is T of Acts, thanksgiving. His line, give us this day our daily bread, is both thanksgiving and supplication. We're asking God for what we need to survive and also trusting and thanking God, knowing that he's going to provide our daily bread. Thanksgiving, like adoration, fixes our minds and our mouths on God and what God has done for us. A nun that was once my spiritual director directed me that nothing scares the demons more than when we thank God. And she encouraged me in a practice that I have used from time to time in my life. And although it's a spiritual practice, interestingly, psychologists are also now directing their patients to do this. Every day, write down five things you're thankful for, for that day, and then read them out loud. And then you've taken in gratefulness with three of your senses. You've seen it, you've heard it, and you've touched your prayer of thanks. When you do this, you will recognize that God is blessing you more than you know, and your faith will grow, your hope will grow, your love will grow, and you'll be strengthened. Give us this day our daily bread is a prayer of thanks and a prayer of supplication. The S in Acts, it means asking God for what we'd like God to do. Jesus' prayer tells us it is okay to ask God for what we need. It's okay to pray for ourselves. It's okay to ask for our very basic needs, like our daily bread. But listen to Jesus' other prayer of supplication. Jesus' prayer asks God also to help make the world more like God wants it. Your kingdom come. Jesus tells us not to let our own will supersede God's. It is what God wills that is most important. Sometimes God may will that an individual that we are praying for may not survive. And this is a hard truth, but Jesus himself had to accept it. Thy will not mine be done. Sometimes God may will justice to be done, and justice may be uncomfortable for us who live so often in injustice. God's will is not our own. If our will to be done, if our will were to be done, though, then earth would never be like heaven, would it? But the good news is God doesn't do our will. God does God's will. Prayer is meant for us to offer our hearts and our hopes and our needs to God and trust in God and his will. And God will hear our prayer. But wait, you say, how can God not do what we want? What about those two examples that Christ gives? The first is, if you go to your friend asking for three loaves of bread because of your persistence, the friend will get up and give you whatever you need. Now let's look a little closer at that parable. Jesus tells us that, of course, we cannot tell God what to do, but God will offer himself to us and and respond to us because of our persistent faith. And yet, listen to the final words of the parable. Because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Did Jesus say he'll get up and give him three loaves of bread? No, he didn't. Perhaps the friend doesn't really need three loaves of bread. Maybe he only needs one. Maybe he needs bagels. I don't know. But the point is that God will hear us, and then God will give us what we need, which might not be the same as what we want. Prayer prayed rightly asks that God's kingdom come and God's will not mine be done. And as we pray this prayer, God gives us this peace that passes understanding 
to be able to accept God's providence and trust that God gives us what we truly and most deeply need. Jesus' second parable illustrates this even more. First he says, ask and it will be given to you, search and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. Now, notice again that Jesus doesn't say, what you ask for, you will receive. He says, ask and you will receive. He doesn't say what you're searching for, you will find. He says, search and you will find. These actions actually go in sequence, don't they? This is what a relationship with Christ looks like. First, we ask for something. Maybe it's a new car or something silly like that. And then we receive something from Christ. It might not be what we ask for, but we're drawn deeper in a relationship over time, and we start searching. We start searching, don't we, for greater meaning, greater purpose, greater peace, greater joy. And as we search, maybe not even knowing what we're searching for, we find God waiting. And then we knock. We knock. And the door will be open. And that is when we enter into relationship with the one who has been waiting for us all along. Jesus then says, if anyone among you, if, if, if your child asks for a fish, would you give him a snake? If your child asks for an egg, would you give him a scorpion? And once again, Jesus doesn't say the child's going to get a fish or an egg. And those of us who have spent a good deal of time with children, I have a 12-year-old, a 7-year-old, and a 5-year-old, we know that most of the time, the best thing for the child is not to give him what he is asking for, be it an extra hour for, of screen time or a $50 new Lego set when he's already got 10 $50 Lego sets. We give the child what, not what he wants, but what he needs. When he's asking for the Lego set, maybe he's really asking, Mom, will you sit down and play with me and my Legos? When he's, when he's asking for the extra screen time, maybe he's saying, I'm bored and I need, you know, some direction to, to do something fun and creative. We give the child not what he wants. We give the child what he needs, and that is what God does for us. And Jesus finishes his teaching by saying, if then you who are evil, this is a hard teaching, friends, you know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give what? The Holy Spirit to those who ask him. And here he comes to the center of this beautiful teaching that the true purpose and gift of prayer is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, the growing of our relationship with Christ through the Spirit, by the Spirit, and in the Spirit. If we seek the Spirit, if we come into greater communion with God, we'll get what we truly need. And it's not a new car. It's not even freedom, really, from, from illness or, or pain. What, what we really need is that peace that passes understanding so that the pains of life may rock us, but they will never topple us. The joys of life will be sweeter, and our hearts will be open to receive the deep and abiding satisfaction of each blessing as a sign of God's great and abiding love. Our deepest fears will lose their power over us, and our deepest longings will be fulfilled. Thanks be to God. C.S. Lewis said, if you look at your life and at your prayers, if you were to look back at all the things you've prayed and all the things that have happened to you, you would see that God really answers more of the prayers than you think. But what is most clear from Jesus' simple prayer is that prayer is not so much communicating but really reorienting. Prayer returns us to God, to focus us on God's will and God's grace. Hebrews 4.20 says, when we draw near to the throne of grace, we will find grace to help in the time of need. You don't need fancy words. You don't need to know Greek. You don't need flowery language or a perfect knowledge of the Bible or good metaphors. All you need is a heart 
that wants to return to God, to know him, to love him, to serve him. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened unto you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Let us say what we believe using the words of the Apostles' Creed found in the bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. 
The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And let us pray. What a gift it is, Lord, to come to the throne of your grace. You know our needs even before we ask God. We thank you that we can come into your presence, you who are wisdom and power, holiness, justice, goodness, and truth. You are the end of all our searching. Our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. We ask, God, that the words of your gospel would sink into us deeper and deeper, and that they would purge us, God, from, from all thoughts and words and deeds that don't give glory to you. God, that the waters of baptism, the baptism with which you so graciously cleansed us, would be a shower over every moment of our days so that everything we do would praise and glorify you. God, we thank you. We, we bless you, God, for giving us every good thing. You provide for the birds of the air, for, for the grasses of the field. You provide for every creature in due season. And to us, too, you fulfill all of our needs. God, we thank you for all your many gifts to us today. And we thank you, God, asking also that you help those who do not have all that they need. God, there are widows and orphans among us. There, there are poor of, of every people on this earth who lack for food or for shelter or for love or for companionship. So many, God, are poor or are ill in body or in mind. There are those who are in the strong grip of addiction and do not know where to turn. God, we ask that you help them and we ask that we would be your hands and feet in helping all those who hurt, especially God, the sick and the hurting that are known to us and who we lift up in our hearts. God, we ask that you would guide us and help us so that your kingdom would come on this earth. We ask especially that you would guide our leaders into your wisdom, into greater wisdom, God, so that they could lead our land into justice and peace. We pray especially for our president, Joe, and for our governor, Gretchen, and for all leaders in local and state and national government. God, we lift up all these things and those that are on our hearts, knowing that you have heard us, trusting that you will answer us. And we pray to you with the prayer you taught us through your Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
leave this place just excited to pray, just excited to come before God and to receive the Holy Spirit more and more, and to know Christ's presence that will never forsake us. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious unto you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you this day, this week, and forever. Amen. Amen.